Hey, Wild Church, good morning. I'm excited to be with you. I hope that you are doing well. I hope that you have enjoyed our fellowship and friendship and uh, all of our food together. Why don't you come on and join me for our, uh, our story, our time of teaching. I'm excited for what I feel like the Lord has laid on my heart. We're in this series that I'm calling Restoration Stories because every single person here is in need of restoration. We all have things in our past that we struggle with, that have put us in disconnect with God, and we are in need of restoration. The question for us today is, what is restoration? How do I get it? Because I don't understand. I look at the things I've done and I go, man, there's no way that I could be forgiven. There's no, there's absolutely no way that restoration is available to me because you don't know the things I've done. Well, interestingly enough, we have a guy today in our in our second Peter passage where Peter is arguing against false prophets and the ungodliness of the world. And he says that this person refuse to accept the ungodliness. Peter says, And if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction and made them an example of what is coming to the ungodly. And if he rescued Lot, a righteous man, greatly distressed by the licentiousness of the lawless, So yes, we're talking about Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah today. This is recorded in Genesis 19, and this story is really strange. So two angels are embody humans, and they come and Lot finds them. They meet Lot at the city gates, and Lot invites them into his home. And he invites them into his home, and then, long story short, at the end of the day, the evening comes. And the men of the city come and politely stated, ask that the men, the travelers, the foreigners, the guests be brought out so that all the men of the city could have their way with them. I'm sure you're familiar with this story. The piece that you may forget is that Lot's first attempt to get them to not do this heinous thing is Lot says, but wait, I'll trade you. Don't touch my friends, but I have two virgin daughters that you can do whatever you want with. And then they don't do that, so the angels make them all go blind. They send Lot and his family out, and they destroy the city by fire and brimstone. Well, Lot on the run finds himself in the foothills, and ends up in a cave. And while he's in this cave, two things happen. On the way there, they were told not to look back. They were told not to look back at Sodom and Gomorrah, and yet Lot's wife chose to look back. I don't know if she's hanging on to the life that she had and what she's giving up to run away or what her reasoning was, but she chooses to look back. And the minute that she looks back, the text says she turned into a pillar of salt. She died because she didn't obey what the angels had told her. So they end up in the foothills of these mountains, and they've been there for a while, and Lot's there with his two daughters. And his daughters say, Hey, We need to have kids. Like, we need to carry on our line. But there are no more men around. We don't see any men. We just watched the whole city be destroyed. So let's concoct a plan. We're going to get Dad, Lot, drunk. And we're going to sleep with him. So night one, they get Lot drunk. And the text says that he slept with them. And she became pregnant. And then it says the oldest daughter came to her younger sister and said, Hey, we did it for me last night. Now it's time. Now it's your turn. 
we're going to do it for you again tonight. And so the very next night, they get Lot drunk again. And he does it again, but this time with his youngest daughter. Now, I don't know about you, but this doesn't seem to be the narrative of a righteous man. He goes and offers up his virgin daughters to be abused sexually and possibly physically. And then he has ancestral relationships with both of them and somehow finds it acceptable to get blackout drunk two different nights in a row. I'm not judging a lot. But that's some, that's some soap opera kind of stuff. That's some weird stuff. And yet, Peter has the audacity to say that he's a righteous man that was distressed by their lawlessness. And yet he himself, we don't have the Jewish law yet at the time, the story is being told, but he himself is lawless. He breaks numerous laws in the Old Testament. But yet he's somehow called righteous. And Peter even goes so far as to say, for that righteous man living among them day after day was tormented in his righteous soul by their lawless deeds and he, that he saw and heard. But yet he seems to act himself very lawless. He does lawless things. He doesn't seem to be a person that I would classify as righteous. He doesn't do deeds of righteousness. And yet, here we are. Peter's interpretation of his story is that he is righteous. So what do we do with this? There's two things I want you to know. Your situation does not determine your status. And your decisions do not determine your destiny. You see, Lot made some bad decisions. Lot found himself in some situations of trauma and mourning. And in them he made some bad decisions. Lot found himself in some stressful situations and made some decisions that were wrong. But your situations don't determine your status and your decisions don't determine your destiny. You may have a past. There may be things in your past that you wish weren't there. You may have done things that you think are heinous. I dare say they're not this bad. I dare say you haven't done some of the things that Lot And yet Lot can be called a righteous man and saved from destruction of the ungodly because righteousness is a destiny. We're told in the New Testament that we are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Your past is covered by a garment of Christ's blood. His resurrection has given you life and a status of righteousness. And this is what Peter means in his final verse, because he says, If all that can happen, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trial and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of justice, of judgment. The Lord knows how to rescue the godly. Your past can't be changed but it does it also is not your identity of your future you've made decisions can I tell you something there's grace for you in the person of Jesus Christ there's grace for your decisions because your decisions don't determine your destiny Christ Jesus determines your destiny so today I want to ask you what are you holding What do you think you've done that's so heinous that you can't be forgiven? What's going on in your life? What's happening around you that you say, man, 
there's no hope for you. Because if that's you today, you're letting your decisions determine your destiny. And there's only one decision that can determine your destiny. And that is the decision of whether or not you will choose 